Carter Dawson. Carter, you're very talented. Thank you. <laughs> Bailey, you look different for some reason. Graduated. He looks graduated a little bit. Yeah, you do look a little bit of graduated. Are you going to go back to school in September just to have something to do? August. In August. How are you already? Sure enough. Where are you going to school? Calhoun. All right. We're going to call it uh, Beauregard, I think, from now on. I don't think we can call it Calhoun anymore. <laughs> It'll be the same school. We'll just have to call it something else. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. There you go. Who knows? Who knew? All right, well, we're glad that you're here. Well, tomorrow, I understand, is Austin Reed's birthday. How much, how, how much is he going to be? He's going to be 28. 28? No. Tomorrow, Terry Ward will be 28 tomorrow as well. So, uh, let's sing happy birthday to them, all right? I don't know if they tuned in or not this morning. We're going to sing to them, and we're going to tell them we sang to you, all right? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right. Well, I do hope they have a good day tomorrow. If you have an opportunity... If you have some way of reaching out to either of them, maybe you send them a note or give them a call, wish them a, a many, as they say, and I like it in Great Britain, they say, many happy returns of the day. All right, Brother Danny, come and lead us. We're going to sing, This is My Father's Word.
have uh, the Bills are with us today. It's always good to see them. Glad that they're here. We're glad that you're here too. This, this is not a safe zone. I remember uh, one time that uh, I was reading the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe uh, by C.S. Lewis, and they, uh, the children were talking to Mr. and Miss Beaver. Kind of tells you about what a little bit of the story's like. And uh, they were having a, a, an argument, a disagreement. And, and uh, Susan was saying, but Mr. Beaver said, and Peter said, that's just it. Beavers are not supposed to say anything. <laughs> Don't be arguing with me about what the beaver said. But then later on, they found out, like everybody kept saying, Aslan's on the move. Aslan's on the move. Well, that was the, what were they were encouraging each other with? It was the, the White Queen was uh, uh, in charge of everything. Everything was winter all the time. They said winter every day, never Christmas. Aslan's on the move. In the story, C.S. Lewis chose a great, huge, gigantic lion to represent the Lord Jesus in the story. Aslan. And the, they said he's a lion. You mean a real? Roaring claws lion? He said, yes, that's Aslan. And Peter asked the question, is he safe? Is he safe? Mr. Beaver said, he's a lion. He's not safe. He's not safe. The Bible talks a great deal about the fear of the Lord, and I think that we need to realize that he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Well, this is not a promised virus-free zone. As a matter of fact, uh, both mules over here, uh, Brian, they're probably crawling with it. They're, they're, they're just, I, I, I won't even get close to them. <laughs> uh, many of the people, uh, the only place, and it's even still then is limited, the only safe place, a place to absolutely be assured of safety, is your home. But uh, we're trying, uh, many of us have had to continue to work. Now, I work at home. I've been safe there. But some of you have had to go to work. Jeannie's retired now. She's not worth killing, so she's not worth it. Does she clean the house, Johnny? Does she at least yeah. dust every once in a while? Does a good job. All right. Well, you know what? You know, sometimes they just quit. Just lay down. Don't pay her, but she doesn't. Well, there you go. <laughs> she might quit on you yet. <laughs> Carter's been going to work, and well, so if you believe in living dangerously, then go by all means go to Kentucky Fried Chicken. Or go, uh, there, there is a new chicken place in Hartsall. I don't know if you knew it or not. But uh, my family, all, they all went to a dance recital last night. I didn't go with them, but uh, they, they went dancing last night. I understand that they did a great job. So, uh, that's, that's wonderful. But you need to realize today, uh, it, it would not be wise to go to any place where there are people and assume that those people have not been in some way in contact with the coronavirus. The numbers have just about tripled or quadrupled for the Morgan County during this last week because people are saying, I'm tired of this staying at home stuff. And more and more people are getting infected. It is only wise to assume that everybody you see, all other people, have possibly uh, been in contact with someone who at least is carrying COVID-19. So that's the only safe course of action. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. All right. Well, it's good to see you here this morning. We're glad that you're here. Continue to pray for others. I know that we have many who are tuning in today. I've spoken to some of you by phone today. There are some tuned in live today and uh, by Facebook. I'm glad if they have that technology that they can do that or catch it now or catch it later. Uh, Andy, what's going on with our Christmas boxes? What the we got our shoe boxes this week from Bucket. He delivered those. They were actually out on the bench that I put up this morning. And uh, we gained a few on the body wash and uh, baby lotion. But outside that, the list that's back there on the table is pretty well accurate. Of what okay. We're short. All right. Thanks to Bucket for bringing our boxes by. We're, we're checking things off step at a time. Continue to pray for Betsy Stevenson. She had some tests this week. I don't know if she got all her results back. I'm scheduled later on in June for a PET scan and an echocardiogram. Still got some a little bit of problems there, but most of it is just ordinariness. 
got to go to the Heart Center this last week. Continue to pray for me. Continue to pray for Victoria's family. Pray for the Eccles family as they continue to mourn uh, the passing of Justin. And, uh, just so uh, there are others that we're praying for, people that we're praying about. Uh, I spoke with Henry yesterday. His Aunt Ruby Posey passed away last week. And uh, so going through weddings and funerals uh, are troublesome. It's, it's always, but during times like this, it seems to make it more difficult. But uh, <clears throat> keep each other in your prayers and your thoughts. <clears throat> Joanne has traveled all the way from the great city of Huntsville to be with us today. She was here for Sunday school and worship. She's faithful. Appreciate that. It's good to see all of you here today. I haven't mentioned all of you, but uh, try to step up your game so that you can make it into the program. You don't have the plans. Today, if you want to make a contribution, you may do so. There's an offer playback on the back. We won't be passing a plate. But uh, if you have not enrolled in our online giving through Kindred, I can help you do that. Or you can, it's easily done. You can do that and give electronically on our church website. So continue to contribute. I thank you for because you have done that. We received a, a tremendous offering last Sunday. Now, next Sunday is Father's Day, the 21st. So we're going to be honoring all of our men, especially our fathers next Sunday. As a matter of fact, I put it in a request that everyone, all of our men, next Sunday receive an extra payday. So you need to come make sure to cash in on that, all right? Okay, if I forget anything, if I overlooked anything, if I stumbled or crumbled on anything. <coughs> I think Addison's going to sing for us later on. Addison, you going to sing today? No, wait, that was Ronnie. Ronnie, you going to sing? It's Ronnie. It's Ronnie. Ronnie. Not, not Addison. All right, Danny, come and lead us as more as we sing, and then I'm looking forward to hearing Ronnie sing as well. <clears throat> Still uh, miss everything. 
Now, but sometimes if you just, it's, we, we tend to think, well, maybe I just need to rub a little bit hard. See, just like, and, and then you're, you are connected. But we're learning during this time an important lesson. That sometimes we don't have to be even in the same room to stay in touch with each other. We don't have to shake hands or bump fists to let each other know that we're supporting each other, we're encouraging each other, that we're friendly, that we're accepting, we're receiving. That's an important lesson to learn because, you know, I've never even seen God, and yet I feel very connected to Him. I feel very connected to God, even though I've never seen Him or heard His voice. And so, this is teaching me an important lesson. I can be close to God, even though He and I are not holding hands, we're not arm in arm as we travel through life together. He is with me. The Bible says He is in me. We're connected. Even though my connection to Him is faith. We can learn how to be in touch with each other. How to be close to each other. Even in times like this. And I hope that you will do everything that you can to reach out to people. Let, you know, let them know that you're thinking of them. You're praying for them. And that you are still doing everything you can to build them up and hold them up. Say, so I'm praying for you. Your name is in our prayer warrior. I called your name out. I called you on the phone, sent you a card. I, I put in our electronic bulletin a picture of Addison and Avery from last week. Actually, they were coloring and drawing, and as they're very gifted to do, but they happened to be at the beach at the time. But some of you have received cards from them. Every week, they send out some cards to people if they want to say, we love you, we miss you, we care about you. And so I want to thank them. I appreciate their hard work. They're receiving those cards as a greater blessing than anything that I could ever offer myself. Now, if, you, if they've seen you here and you've been able to come, <coughs> pardon me, then they probably haven't sent you a card. Don't feel left out. But they've reached out especially to people who have been confined and can't get out and go much of anywhere. It's important to let them know. Addison and Avery Buell have been doing that ever since the pandemic began. So thank them very much. We appreciate it. All right. Then you come and lead us in another song, and then I'll then rise and sing.
But uh, it's so good to see my church family. I pray for you, for your safety and, and your health daily. Because you know, I, I love you. You're my church family. And uh, I, I love, love Jesus. Thank you for what he's done. I'm so glad for God's mercy and his grace. Y'all listen to the, this song, Mercy Built the Bridge. got two of them back up, it was like this. <laughs> Faded out this morning and need a little bit more help. We're in the book of 1 Corinthians. 
there are two letters, there probably were at least four letters written by Paul the Apostle to the church that he founded. We can read about the creation or the starting of the Corinthian church in the book of Acts. Paul came in and he began to preach and teach in the Jewish synagogues there at Corinth, which was a Greek city-state on the coast. And uh, they, uh, many believed in Jesus because of his testimony. And they started a church there. And later on, as he was traveling, he would hear word from them. He was not the pastor of the church, but he was the founder. And well, he was a spiritual leader. Also, even after he left and got back to his missionary touring, there were still many people who were so fond of him that they clung to his leadership and to his uh, to his memory and to his leader, to uh, everything that he'd done for them. They were appreciative. It's understandable. There are two letters that he mentions in these letters that he said, you remember in this letter I said this or that, and we don't have that letter. Uh, so there are two letters that God said, well, that's not important. He did not uh, sovereignly guide the council to include this in the biblical canon. So we have 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians in our New Testament as part of the 27 books. I've chosen at this point, I changed gears last Sunday, and instead of Jekyll and Hyde in the church, I believe, and more precisely, Paul addresses the readers as babies in the church. Not people who have turned into monsters like the Jekyll and Hyde story of Robert Louis Stevenson. But let's look on. Let's go on to that part. Hit that. Uh, here is the in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I've read this several times. But this you know, requires uh, taking note of. He said, Dear brothers, I've been talking to you as if you were just babies in the Christian life. Babies who are not following the Lord but your own desires. I can't talk to you as I would to healthy Christians who are filled with the Spirit. I have had to feed you with milk and not with solid food because you couldn't digest anything stronger. Even now, you still have to be fed on milk. Hold it right there for just a minute, Carter, because he's talking about the fact that they are immature. They received Christ. They heard the message of Jesus and they became Christians. They, they believed in the story of Jesus, His death, burial, and resurrection. They had faith in Him and that brought them into the, the walk as a Christian. And yet, the Bible teaches also, Jesus took the twelve disciples with Him and He taught them. And they were learning. That's what the word disciple means. It means a learner. And the disciples grew. And they grew in understanding. And they grew in spiritual strength. And they, they began to develop spiritual roots and to, to uh, produce spiritual fruit. It is important when, you know, the... When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he says, becoming a Christian is like being born. It's like being reborn. And so the next step in our spiritual life as Christians is to grow up. But sadly, many Christians do not grow up. It's very sad that sometimes we see children who, for some reason or other, that they do not physically or mentally or emotionally grow up. They... Their body may get taller. They may put on weight or their hair may begin to grow longer. They may ex ex seem to express many different forms or features of growth. And yet there may be something about them that still remains very childish or childlike. We know that something is wrong when that happens. We love children and children are sweet. Doesn't this baby look sweet? Go to the next slide there, Carter. But what happens often is that Christians fail to mature and grow. And Paul is making that accusation to the Corinthians. We need to, only we ourselves, and you know, if, if Paul were to tell me that I was immature, that I was just a baby Christian, now, they've only been Christians for only a few years. 
But I do meet people, and I have met people over my years in ministry, who have been in the church for a very long time and still act very childishly. You know what childishness is in a Christian? We see it here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says there are debates and, and divisions. There's conflict in your church. Children tend, children tend to fuss and fight and not agree. They're not very harmonious. A part of immaturity is not being able to get along, not to be able to be at peace. A mature way of looking at things gives us calm and it gives us a sense of awareness. And we are less likely to be angry or upset or to persecute each other or to blame each other. We're a little more thoughtful as we grow older when we mature. Babies don't think. They kind of fly off the handle. They act. They are impetuous. They are, they are stormy. They have tantrums. We never know what's going to happen if we allow them to continue in that. Uh, I saw a, a, a drawing even this morning. It showed some crazy person in a riot up in Minneapolis and said, you know those children who were always screaming and hollering at Walmart? They grew up. They didn't really grow up. They just got older. And now they're still acting childishly. They're immature. And it causes anger, bitterness, resentment, hatred, jealousy, envy. All of those things are not just terrible Emotions, they are childish. And they are marks of immaturity. And he tells them that the number, he, he then wants to say, well, let me give you an example. Let me, I just called you little babies in Christ. He said, now let me back that up. He says that they're immature about the center of the church. Hit that next slide there, Carter. He says in the following verses, one of you says, I like Paul, the Apostle Paul. Another says, I like Apollos. Aren't you carnal? Carice came home from school at Arbor one time. She was kind of in a huff. What's the matter? I don't like Susie Jones anymore. Really? Yep. Susie Jones was checked off her list. She didn't like Susie Jones anymore. You know, that's, right now, uh, I know that she is a nurse manager. She deals with crazy people who are patients and also on her staff. <laughs> they put her in charge of that because they felt like you can do that. She's mature. She's grown up. She's gained their confidence. And I'm sure that some of them aggravate her or irritate her. She's in the process of making many pearls right now. A whole necklace. Many irritations. But she never has the luxury anymore of saying, I don't like that patient. I don't like that employee. Liz's manager too. She she could allow herself not to like certain people if she wanted to. You can do that. You know, not liking someone or liking someone. I was listening to a late night talk show a number of years ago. And uh, Dennis Miller, it's a Dennis Miller, you know him or not. He's a comedian. He evidently doesn't care anything about being funny anymore. He's gone into politics or broadcasting political viewpoint. Dennis Miller. And uh, he was talking with Geraldo Rivera, and Geraldo says they were talking about President Obama. And Geraldo Rivera said to Dennis Miller, well, it's, obviously, it's obvious that you don't like the guy. I'm talking about President Obama. It's obvious you don't like the guy. Dennis Miller said, it has nothing to do with whether I like President Obama or not. His policies, that's, I disagree with his views, his, his political views. I, I'd go out and have a drink with the, with the president. I'd play golf with him. He seemed like a nice guy. 
and you think I don't like him? You see, that's the way children think about liking things and not liking things. You know what Avery says if she puts some food in her mouth and she doesn't like you know what she says? I not like that. And then she spits it out. I not like that. But we know that as she gets older, that in the future when she grows up, she'll put something that is nasty in her mouth that somebody cooked for her. You know what she's going to do? Mmm, that's, mm, that's so good. Thank you for cooking that for me. I appreciate that. And to swallow it, go oh, there, could I have some more? We know it's a mark of maturity. Because there are things we're not going to like and things we do, but it's a mark of maturity. You cannot go around and say, well, I don't like them. I don't like this. I don't like that. Doesn't that sound like a kid? He says, aren't you carnal? He says, some of you say, I like Paul. And some of you say, I like Apollos. And here's what he says, who is Paul? Who is Apollos? They're just ministers who helped you believe. This is a way that the Lord used to touch all of us. In other words, somebody like Paul or somebody like Apollos told us about Jesus. I have planted Apollos water and God gave the increase. It doesn't matter who plants or who waters. The only thing is that it's God that makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters, they're equal. And every man, every person shall receive his own reward according to their labor. We're laborers together with God. In other words, he says, look, we're in the same family. We're on the same team. We can't allow petty likes and dislikes to split us up. We're all current caretakers. You're God's building. We're what God is making. Look at the next slide there, Carter. You see, he says, you don't understand what is central. <clears throat> what You're missing the point or what is in the middle. You're missing the heart. You're, you're not a see what the center is. Look at the next slide there, Carter. He's going to teach in the rest of this chapter, Jesus is the center of the church. Now I'm going to do my best to offend everybody who's here today, so go ahead, get ready. You can you call the lady and say, you know, I'm not like Brother John. Jesus alone is the center of the church. Paul says, who's Paul? Who's Apollos? You're letting Paul and Apollos be points of division. He says, we're not the center of the church. Let's look at the next slide there, Carter. There's Paul. Now, he's a really great guy. He's one of the greatest Christians who ever lived. It looks like it would be okay if you made him the most important person in your church. All right, let's look at the next slide. There's Apollos. He was supposedly silver-tongued and, uh, and very eloquent, well-spoken, educated. And he was a great Christian, too. He is mentioned in the book of Acts as being, I believe, that Apollos probably wrote the book of Hebrews in our New Testament. It's so completely unlike anything that Paul ever wrote. And yet it is eloquent, and the Greek language chosen is that of a scholar. Not a hatchet man like Paul. You, you could make Apollos pivotal, key, the, 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 the leader of your church where Apollos is, we all gravitate around Apollos in our church. He's such a great Christian that it seems like that, that would work, but it, it won't. Let's look at the next slide, Carter. Because all it really does you see, some were saying, I am of Paul. Others were saying, I am of Apollos. But all it was really tending to do was to divide the church. It caused the church to be on this side or that side. It didn't matter if Jesus was still in the church or not, or even if he was located somewhere in between the split. It still was this side and that side, and that is the way little children split up on the playground. Let's go on, Carter, to the next slide. 
Beginning back in the late 1800s and moving on into the 1900s, a man appeared on the scene here in America named Taze Russell. His words were very eloquent. He was very intelligent. He stirred a lot of interest, and a lot of people were excited about his Christian teachings. A lot of people were enamored by Brother Russell, by his preaching and his teaching, and especially his writing. He believed that God had especially ordained him to build, now in the, in the book Revelation chapter 7, it mentions the 144,000. And he believed that he had been ordained to gather together in the last days those 144,000 believers so that Jesus could return. But the fact of the matter is that he became so, they, they would say, you're number one, you're number two, three. And they, everybody had a number. They would say, you're number 152. You're number 140,000. But they were so successful and they grew so big and their coffers and their contributions became so plentiful that they soon surpassed 104, they had more than 144,000. They had to change their theology a little bit to explain that. They're the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses. Are they still knocking on doors with gloves and masks on? don't know. If you are a former Jehovah's Witness, or maybe you are current, or you have family members, then I just offended you, so yes. The thing is, is that they were so enamored with his charisma and his personality and his vitality that they weren't listening very closely to actually what he was teaching and what he believed. And so, I believe a church, an entirely new belief system was created that I believe is an error. In my opinion, I believe they're an error. They're a Christian organization. They claim themselves to be the holders, the only holders of Christian truth. And yet there are many, many, many more of them than 144,000 in the world today. They're the most evangelistic, outreaching, door-knocking Christian community on the face of the planet. And yet I believe Taze Russell's doctrine, which they still hold to, was an error. Let's look at the next slide. Ellen White. You ever been, I don't know if they do it anymore, you ever been in the doctor's office? And they you go to the doctor's office, by the pediatrician's office, and they have that Bible stories book. It's colorful in the front. It's all pretty. It's, it's nicely bound and everything. It's got a story. The very first one is about Adam and Eve. Ellen White. Placed there by her people. I remember every time I went to the doctor, I, even though we didn't go to church very much, the artwork in that was so amazing. And it was Bible stories by Ellen White. And she was a prolific, you know, she really was a woman. She wasn't allowed to preach or sing very much, but uh, she could write. And she was a prolific writer. And still today, the world is filled with thousands of her books and her pamphlets and her manuscripts and writings. And I believe that her teaching, even though she was eloquent and she had a way of saying things that nobody had ever said before. And the, the, the movement grew and her church assumed it. And they were successful in every respect. They're the Seventh-day Adventists. The Seventh-day Adventists. Ellen White. Center. All right, let's go to the next slide. I already know this guy. An angel from God actually came to this man and told him things that no man had ever heard before. He wrote them down in golden plates, gave him special magical glasses so he could read them. Thousands of people follow his teaching today. There are actually two different churches, but they still hold to what I believe is his error. But it was his presentation. It was the fact that he had an angelic message from the angel Morani. That he had an extra set of writings, the Pearl of Great Christ. This is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
Today, millions of people are members of the Mormon church, and I believe that their teaching is seriously in error. Let's go on. You know, I've been preaching for 50 years, and I have always found it difficult to get church members to attend church, to read their Bible, and to pray, and to give. This guy told his members to drink poison Kool-Aid, and it went on the brain. <laughs> I'm thinking, there's a whole world full of church members out there who drink the Kool-Aid, who become so enamored. Now, you may not know about the People's Temple, but when they were in Los Angeles, they were just church. If you ever seen videos of the People's Temple, they raise their hands and they sing hymns, they have prayer, and they have preaching, and they have church. It's a Christian organization. Now, when they got out of the jungles of Guyana, they killed eight, over 800 of them, drank that poison Kool-Aid, and died. And you think, well, he's a nut. If you can look at some of his old videos, he says, well, that guy could preach a revival in our church. There are millions of immature Christians. They're looking for somebody like Paul. They're looking for somebody like Apollos. They're looking for somebody like Joseph Smith. They're looking for somebody like Jim Jones to be their leader. You know why? Because they don't know Jesus. They've never met Jesus. They can't hear or see Jesus. They have no concept of any kind of connection or contact or link with Jesus. And so all they can do is look and see who's up in the pulpit and say, that's who I'm going to listen to. Let's look at the next slide, Carter. David Courage. Another, another one that led all of his people, most of his people, to their deaths. Because they were following him. He was central. He was central. And immature Christians, one of the greatest mistakes that they make is to find someone that they can see and they can touch and they can hear and they can link up with or, or fellowship with. And they say, I'm going to put that, make that person central in my Christian life. And it's a sign of great, great, great error in spiritual immaturity. Let's go on to the next slide, Carter. Just pick your favorite there, I guess. There's several, several that I just picked at random. The thing is, is that you might know who that person is. You recognize his face, and when you're flipping through the channels, you see him. You say, I know his name, but do you know what he teaches? Do you know what he preaches? Do you know what he believes? I had some very faithful members when I was at the Foster Hill Baptist Church. They supported his ministry. They sent him money every month. You know why? Because they love to hear him play the piano and sing. But his teaching is an error. He has many other problems as well. The thing is, is that you may know who these people are. I recognize that person. If I were to ask you, do you know what their basic beliefs are? Do you know what their foundational faith is? Do you know what they teach and preach and believe in? No, but I know he's on channel 12, so you know. Right? People have read their books and watched their program and contribute to them and have no idea what they're teaching is because when these people become so famous that they become celebrities, Jesus always takes a back seat. Hit that next slide there, Carter. And just in case I didn't offend you, there's a whole, there's about all of them. And you know what? They're gaining members all the time. They're adding to their congregation. Their churches are getting bigger all the time. Their contributions are getting larger all the time. You could just take you a list box of all the things that you think make a successful church and you say, this is a successful church because they're adding members. And they're reaching people. And there's more every time tune in to their program. But you will watch the way everything is sculpted and the way everything is portrayed that they are the center of their organization. Listen, Paul says, look, I'm Paul the Apostle. You shouldn't even give me that kind of attention. Apollos is a great Christian and teacher. 
You shouldn't make Apollos the pivotal, most important person in your church. Get the next slide there, Carter. In Psalm 62, 5, it says, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. The preacher or the Christian leader is never to be the most important person in the church. He's not to be the person upon which everything rises and falls. He is not the one who determines whether it will succeed or fail. We need to see that in every church, in any church, that Jesus must be central. And all of our expectations must be of Him. Do you expect the preacher to do this or to say that or to act this way? Throw all that away. All you're going to find out in that is being disappointed or if He fulfills all of your expectations, you know what you're going to do? You're going to make Him central to the church. In Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. Hit that next slide there, Carter. Do you know who babies trust? Think about it now. I'm not, that's a rhetorical question. Be quiet. Do you know who babies trust? Select the next slide there, Carter. I'll click on it again. Their mama, their dad, Paul, the apostle, their pastor, or others. Charles Manson! That's who babies trust. Last slide. Only trust Him. How many churches have split because the pastor took a bunch of people and took them with him? Were they following Jesus when they followed that pastor down the road to start another church? Can't convince me of that. When church members find themselves, well, I'm on this side, oh, I'm on that side, sound like a bunch of children who have made the pastor or some other person in their church central. Only trust Him. Paul said, you're those little bitty babies. And you're making the wrong person the center. Danny's going to lead us in a hymn of invitation right now. It's not a walk the aisle or a kneel at the altar kind of invitation. It's a do business with God from where you are right now. We call it only trust Him. And really the emphasis is on the word trust. But today I want you to think, only trust Him. Him. Preacher, do you not like Him? you not like the preacher? you not like the preacher's sermon? you not like a position of leadership? you not like a direction? It's childishness. <clears throat> Maybe Christian stuff. Don't you believe that Jesus can do anything He wants to in His church? That He can change anything? That He can make anything happen that He wants to have happen? If He's the sinner. Danny, come and leave us as we pray for this invitation.
in regard to the invitation, anytime that you need someone to talk to or pray with you or you need direction, please let us know. The invitation is always open. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you for this day, Father, for the word that we've heard, Lord. May we each look to mature and grow in you, Father, and keep you center of our lives and our and follow your will, Father. May you watch over us, protect us, bring us back safely next week to, to join together and praise you, Father. Thank you for this day and bless us. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Be safe, everybody.